All right, so we're very happy to have Mark Gross, uh, who is going to tell us about the canonical scattering diagram. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, I'm afraid you know, I had turned down invitations to this annual workshop a number of years in a row because traveling to the US in November or December or in the middle of term always seemed rather difficult, but now <laughs> it's easy. Uh, so that's a positive aspect of the virus. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, canonical scattering diagrams. Uh, in some sense, this is um, the end of a whole sequence of ideas, which I've been developing roughly over the last 20 years. Um, and so what was the original motivation was, uh, well, let, let me phrase things in, in uh, uh, sort of restricted context, but um, what we'll do is we'll start with a, a log Calabial pair. Uh, x comma d. Uh, so here, uh, d is a simple normal crossings divisor. And just to keep life simple in this talk, I'm going to assume that this is minimal in the sense that kx plus d equals zero. And uh, d is maximally degenerate. Uh, in the sense that it has a zero dimensional stratum. Uh, so this is a context in which we hope that mirrors exist. And so in particular, we want to construct the mirror family. Mark, excuse me. I remember yeah. you don't assume kx plus d to be zero. Uh, now that's that's correct, but uh, I just want to keep life simple in this talk. It means a little bit less than I have to explain. I see. Uh, in fact, you, I mean, it's more or less the same setup that you have where you, uh, you essentially need to have a non vanishing homology form an interior, but you don't need it to have simple poles on the boundary. You can have some zeros. Um, okay, so this can be done. So Uh, using the construction of um, myself and Siebert, uh, the paper uh, Intrinsic Mirror Symmetry. Or with some additional assumptions, uh, Kiel and you, um, uh, with some additional assumptions. Uh, by directly constructing the coordinate ring of the mirror. Using some flavor of grove wooden theory on this pair XD. So do I assume that uh, D is ample? Or... I, no, I have no assumption on, on D here. Uh, so X minus D could be not a fine here. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so as I say, this um, uh, TLU requires that, but uh, yeah. we don't. Uh, uh, and, and my understanding from, from Tony is that mostly has to do with issues of virtual fundamental class uh, in. Um, uh, in non-Archimedean from Wooden Theory. Uh, so in a sense, this is, so both of these works are 2019. Uh, so in a sense, this problem is solved. Uh, however, in general, you'd like to have a somewhat more uh, detailed construction. And what we'd like to do is to connect this to an older point of view. in terms of what uh, we call scattering diagrams, which I will eventually define, or sometimes wall structures. Okay, so let me give a little bit of uh, history 
this story. So it was clear around 2000, uh, once one thought deeply about the Schrodinger Zassel conjecture, that you have the following kind of problem. So you fix, um, so suppose given an affine, integral affine manifold with singularities. Uh, so we have B. Uh, so what does this mean? We have B0 contained in B is an integral manifold, integral affine manifold. So in other words, there are some, some coordinate charts, uh, uh, some atlas with transition maps being integral affine transformations. And uh, you should think of B as being the base of an SYZ vibration on some Clavier manifold or maybe log Clavier. I think B the base of an SYZ vibration. So there's a simple construction you can do, which is you can take the tangent bundle, let me call this X of B zero. This is defined to be the tangent bundle of B zero modulo the local system of uh, uh, a flat, yeah, so affine flat vector field. So here, uh, lambda, so if, if uh, y1 through yn are local affine coordinates on uh, B0, then Lambda is the local system with basis uh, locally given by the tangent vector fields, the fundamental vector fields associated with these coordinates. So this gadget is then a, uh, a torus bundle over V0. And not only that, it comes with, X of B0 comes with a, a canonical choice of complex structure. Uh, so that's the complex structure of that, uh, uh, essentially the, the almost complex structure J just uh, swaps the horizontal and vertical tangent spaces in, in the obvious way with one of them putting the negation. Okay, so uh, this comes with a canonical complex structure and what you like to do, uh, this is sitting over B zero and the affine structure will not extend to all of B. Generally speaking, what you might expect is that B minus B zero is some codimension one or two locus. So we'll like, Uh, extend or compactify X of B zero sit inside some X of B uh, as a complex manifold. Now, um, well, you don't really expect to be able to do that. Uh, and in particular, uh, what you do expect is that you're going to have to somehow perturb the complex structure. On X of B zero before we can compactify. So this problem was really first taken up, how you might perturb this was first taken up by Fukaya in 2001, uh, when he looked at the case where dimension B is equal to two. And he gave a very heuristic argument that somehow, so you have some, uh, basically you would start with a, a sphere uh, and you would add some singularities, typically 24 singularities, and the complex structure would have to be perturbed uh, with the perturbations or being uh, 
concentrate along some gradient flow lines emanating from the singularities. And when these gradient flow lines intersect, some more complicated picture arises where you increase, add some new gradient flow lines. And morally, this picture would be mirrored to uh, some kind of mass on index zero disk with boundary on fibers of the uh, torus vibration. Uh, so we have this initial heuristic picture and using sort of a slightly different philosophy, uh, Kinsevich and Sogleman in 2004, Uh, again, with dimension B equals two, uh, showed how to construct this kind of non-Archimedean K3 surface using a version of the built picture which is essentially algorithmic. So in the sense that there is some algorithm which allows you to start, you have these sort of corrections coming out of these uh, singular points. And you can think of these, uh, these uh, rays as giving you walls so that you have to glue some standard pieces uh, on opposite sides of walls via some automorphism uh, obtained from crossing these walls. And when two of these walls collide, is you need some sort of consistency uh, for the booing. In other words, you need the composition of automorphisms around these points to be the, uh, the identity. You're forced to add new rays in order to get that kind of consistency. Uh, and so that was all done quite algorithmically, and there's some beautiful structures involved with what happens over here. Uh, I think we'll hear a bit more about that kind of thing uh, in, in Mandy's talk today. Um, so this was the first sort of rigorous uh, point of view on this. And then uh, myself and Siebert in 2007, uh, essentially using the same algorithmic philosophy though in a slightly different setup, uh, extended to all dimensions. So this was, you know, in all these cases, essentially algorithmic in the sense that you know, there's something you could put on a computer. Uh, and a priori, it's not entirely clear whether Foucault's original picture, where these, uh, these th sort of tropical pictures of, sort of trees with uh, roots on the uh, singular points uh, really had an interpretation as in terms of real written picture. So uh, then there's sort of various works in the late, uh, late thousand, uh, 2000s, late noughties. Uh, so for example, uh, Denis uh, gave a more explicit description of uh, corrections uh, to the complex structure. Uh, in terms of mass on index zero disks. Uh, mass on index uh, zero disk uh, counts on the mirror side. So then a uh, work of myself, Ponder, Ponder, and Siebert gave an enumerative interpretation to what's going on at these points with these commutator formulas uh, and showed that these could actually be described, uh, what's going on here uh, can be described in terms of some relative ground wind invariance. And from this, so this said, uh, sort of described a piece of the algorithm of uh, conservation and Solomon uh, in terms of ground wind theory. And 
And this led uh, to work with myself hacking in Kiel in 2011 to the canonical scattering diagram. Uh, in dimension two, so for two dimensional volatile objects. So the one piece that was sort of generally missing still from the, this uh, general approach to thinking about mirror symmetry is a higher dimensional version of, of this. And so a uh, canonical scattering diagram in all dimensions Uh, is then was announced uh, in a 2016 paper uh, and will be out soon. And I was hoping it would be out this year, but um, my coffee is still working on his part. So it uh, should be out pretty soon. Okay, so that's, that's a brief history. And now uh, let me get into some details. Uh, of course, I haven't explained yet what a scattering diagram is, uh, what's special about it, what it does for us, but hopefully that will become clear when we go forward. Okay, so uh, here's our basic setup. So let's fix uh, XD as, as before. Uh, so here D is, let's write explicitly as some sum of Boundary values di's, so simple normal crossings, uh, and kx plus d equals zero. As Tony uh, asked, uh, I don't need to assume kx plus d is equal to zero, but I want to keep the talk relatively free of too, too much, uh, uh, too many details. Okay, and um, so then for all i uh, contained in uh, the index that went through s. Uh, denote, let's write d sub i be the intersection of all i and i of d sub i. So uh, this will be a stratum, um, the, a stratum of d. And let's assume just for ease of discussion here, let's assume that d i is always connected. So in other words, uh, something like this for D is good, but something like this is bad because the intersection of D1 and D2 is disconnected, consists of two points. And it's not a serious issue, but it makes, again, makes description a bit easier. Okay, so now let's let div, uh, div D of X be the, the group of divisors. Supported on D. And uh, so that is, that can be just written as a direct sum of the one to S of Z and DI, the three of the dealing with J and the DIs. And I'll write div D of X uh, dual is uh, let me write some R is the dual vector space. Uh, so let's direct sum i for one to s, z, what this is di star. Uh, okay, so I'm going to build a standard object, which one can think of as being, say, the tropicalization of the pair xd or the dual complex of d. And I define this as follows. So let's let p be just the set of sum over i and i, r greater or equal to zero di star, uh, where i runs over index sets one through f, subset of one through s, such that the corresponding stratum di is non-empty. So this is just a set of cones, of standard cones in this vector space, which record how the various di's intersect. Then I'm going to take, uh, so let B be the union sigma and P of sigma. So this is just, again, this is some sort of 
so object, uh, geometric object, a cone complex in, uh, in this vector space, uh, and which we can think of, so BP, together we can think of as the dual complex of XD, or these days we tend to call it the tropicalization. of XD. Okay, uh, so the main point of what we have to do now is we need to define, uh, we should think of B, so think. B is the base of an SYZ vibration. from X minus D to B. And of course, we're not actually building a vibration here and we never make use of vibration, but morally that's the role it's played. And as such, you should think of it as carrying an affine structure or integral affine structure with singularities. So I want to define uh, such a structure. Yeah, but uh, non immediately you really have a map from X minus D. That's right, yeah. So yeah. so one can use it using uh, what, what you proposed in this, um, or detailed by Nikesh, Shu, and you, uh, you can, you should be able to build a non uh structure, uh, SYZ foundation. And essentially, the affine structure I'm going to define is the one that uh, Nikesh, Shu, and you wrote down. Sorry, Mark, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so you actually defined the dual complex of this pair, right? So, which is actually different from the dual intersection graph or dual intersection complex. Right. Or it, it is the, literally the same? Well, it's uh, so you might view the dual intersection complex of D as being a, a simplicial complex rather than a cone complex. Right. Uh, so here I want to think of it as a cone complex. Right. Because like a long time ago, do you remember we talked about that? Like, uh, so for the dual intersection complex, we uh, first we need to choose uh, like a torque degeneration first in your program, right? And once right. we, right, once we, zoom in the central fiber and then we can build up like a two intersection complex of the central fiber. Right. And is it like, uh, how, how can these two guys, like how can this do complex and the inters and the, the do intersection complex in that case be related okay. to each other? Yeah. So, so let, let me make a quick remark. Uh, so, and th this is actually quite an important point because the, um, this whole setup can also be applied to degenerations of the atoms. So setup also applies to maximum unipotent degenerations. Of Calabia. So what you would typically start with is some degenerate family, say over disk D. Uh, and so you have a very singular fiber, which we'll assume is normal crossings. Uh, singular fiber. And then you can consider, so apply the above construction uh, to the pair X, X zero. Uh, so this then gives rise to one of these uh, BP, but we also uh, have canonically uh, the map, so the morphism X to D, uh, sorry, X to B, uh, actually uh, induces uh, a map from a B to R greater to the zero. In fact, this map is just induced by the divisor X zero. Right? And that's one. Uh, one reason why it's useful to think about B is sitting inside this dual group is X zero is some divisor supported on X zero. It might come with some, uh, of course, multiplicities. It might be non-reduced, uh, uh, but it does define a, uh, a functional on here and hence defines a map from B to R greater equal to zero. And then um, the uh, tra more traditional dual complex
does call this map uh, psi. The more it, a traditional dual intersection complex of x zero is uh, psi inverse of one. So you just look at sort of the height one slice of B. And now instead of this with simple normal crossings, you would have a, a simplicial complex rather than a cone complex. So everything I'm going to say will fit inside this, this context here. So okay. is Psi linear on the cones? Uh, psi is linear on each cone, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. It, it's, it's a linear function on, on div, div D of X on each cone is linear. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's next construct the construction of affine structure on, on B. Uh, or maybe b minus delta zero, b minus delta, where delta is the union over all sigma and p, and sigma with dimension sigma equal to n minus two. So here n is the dimension of our ambient uh, x. Uh, by the way, I think I forgot to say when I was doing a setup here, um, I didn't actually re, uh, assume also, let me just add this. So uh, assume also there exists an I such that dimension VI is equal to zero. So there's a zero dimensional stratum. And then uh, this is actually pure dimensional. It is certainly pure, uh, dimension M is as an N dimensional cone. But in fact, one can show uh, that uh, this is actually a pure dimension, dimension n. Okay, so in other words, I'm taking uh, the co-dimension to uh, cones, uh, and I'm going to use that to define the, uh, uh, I'm going to define half on structure on B0. So the, um, uh, this was actually in, in our 2016 announcement uh, but sort of the more general setup when KX, when we don't assume the normality, uh, this is more generally, which was done in um, uh, Nick has uh, Shu Yu, and the philosophy introduced there is, uh, is really the one we're making use of. Okay, so uh, for let's choose a cone rho in, in P. With dimension of rho being n minus one, and rho uh, you can show is contained in two maximal cells. It's another property that follows from minimal model theory that you actually each co-dimension one cell the cone is contained in two uh, n-dimensional cones. So rho will be uh, spanned by some basis vectors, which I'll write as di1 star through di n minus one star. Uh, so that corresponds to the stratum given by the intersection of these n minus one divisors. And then sigma, I might write as the span of di1 star through di n star. And sigma prime, I'll write as di one star through di n minus one star, and then one additional different generator. And then I'm going to define an embedding. Sigma union sigma prime in Rn with basis, standard basis E1 through En by, so this embedding is going to be linear on each of these maximal cones. Then you just send Dij star to Ej. So this is what I do on sigma. I just send sigma to the standard uh, the, uh, positive orthos 
of Rn. And uh, of course, that also defines the map on these uh, generators of sigma prime. So I just need to tell you where this generator maps to. So I'm going to send Din prime star. And this gets mapped to minus En minus summation j equal one uh, to n minus one of uh, dij dot with the stratum uh, corresponding to uh, rho, so the stratum consisting of intersection of divisors uh, listed here. Uh, so that's a divisor dotted with a one dimensional stratum uh, and then I multiply that by ej. So this, this makes sense as an integer. That's uh, intersectional. Okay, so what's going on here is that essentially the idea is that if you look at, at a one dimensional strata corresponding to rho, then a sort of a neighborhood of that stratum should sort of morally looks like a torque row. Uh, and what I'm describing is an embedding of sigma union sigma prime in Rn. So we get the actual fan of that torque rod. And this is designed so that that torque rod e has the right intersection of this. Um, so there's a way of making that sort of more, more rigorous in the case Shu Yu, for example, they show that as long as these intersection numbers are negative, then actually a formal neighborhood of the one dimensional stratum is isomorphic to a formal neighborhood of the corresponding one dimensional stratum of this, the torque variety defined by this, this fan. Uh, in my own world, uh, we see that as saying that actually the log structures on the one dimensional stratum are new. Uh, so it's a very natural thing to do. And this then gives a chart. An affine coordinate chart. Uh, psi rho from uh, the interior of sigma union sigma prime uh, to Rn. Think of this as being the star rho. Uh, and this then allows us, this gives us uh, coordinate charts on open sets covering uh, B minus delta, um, covering B zero. Okay, so that's the, the outline structure. Uh, this is usually easiest to think about in two dimensions, um, but I think for, for want of time, I will avoid going through an example in two dimensions, um, and at least two dimensions somewhat. Been around for a while. Okay, um, a little bit more data I need to pick. Uh, so let's, kind of, let's fix a monoid. Uh, P uh, contained inside the, say, the second homology of X. Uh, so this should satisfy a couple of properties. First of all, uh, P is a saturated monoid, uh, namely uh, in P in P uh, implies P is in P if M is a positive integer. Um, we should assume, for example, that uh, P is finally generated, probably not that important. And we'll assume that uh, the set of invertible elements in P, just the torsion part of H2. And then finally, uh, we'll assume that P contains all classes of effective curves in X. So uh, what we're going to do is so ultimately we construct, uh, let me, let me, okay. so we're going to choose such a monoid. 
and let's let m uh, be the maximal ideal, uh, so p minus p star would be the ideal. And uh, k bracket p is the monoid ring. And we might, for example, complete it. Um, so the basic idea is what we're going to construct. Uh, a formal scheme over uh, the formal spectrum of the uh, completed uh, K bracket P. So this is completion with respect to the maximum ideal M with the ideal M. So you should think of this as that we're building a family which a priori it's only formal in some nice cases, might actually extend all spec k bracket at p, for example, from Banerjee's force and ample divisor. Uh, but opera in general, we construct some, some formal gadget like this. Uh, so you can think of this as somehow being a kind of Novikov type ring, which keeps track of curved classes. Okay, um, so now it's time to define what we mean by scattering diagram and definition. A wall P F P for the data uh, B P and P is uh, consists of two things. So first of all, the rational polygonal cone. Uh, P uh, contained in some uh, cell sigma, some, some cone sigma P. Uh, hopefully my, uh, this is gonna be confusing. Let me switch to B, which the other standard notation I use. Otherwise my P's, little P's and big P's are gonna look the same. So rational module cone D sitting inside some cone in P uh, with dimension of D equal to N minus one. So it's a co-dimension one cone. Uh, you always want your walls to be co-dimension one, otherwise they don't keep anything out. And FP is some maybe formal power series, FP. I'll just write a summation CI T to the AI Z to the MI. Possibly infinite sum. Where each monomial uh, CI T to the AI Z to the MI lies in the uh, polynomial ring over the monoid ring, or sort of the wrong polynomial ring, uh, lambda D. Where Lambda D is the lattice of integral tangent vectors. To this cone D. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. So in your second bullet, is it like F sub D? Ah, uh, yes, thanks. Yeah, I, I need to remember to uh, do my conversion from P's to D's. Okay, so we have some sort of uh, a priori formal power series. We should have a couple uh, properties. So FD uh, should be a polynomial modulo any ideal I, any monomial ideal I contained in P uh, with radical of I equal to our maximum ideal. Uh, and FD should be congruent to one modulo of the maximum. Okay, so the constant term is one, everything else is going to involve some uh, non trivial uh, powers here, T to the AI, with AI being the maximum idea. 
So that's what a wall is. Um, it's just it's really just a one co-dimensional one wall inside B, along with this extra bit of algebraic wall. But then a scattering diagram. A D uh, or a wall structure. Uh, is a collection of walls. Uh, such that uh, for any ideal I uh, with radical of I equals M, um, the set of walls D, F, D in D uh, such that F, D is not congruent to one mod I is finite. Okay, so it's a collection of walls uh, generally, this will be an infinite number of walls and because it's a huge amount of vastly complicated data, but module any given ideal uh, with radical n, uh, the set of walls with sort of non trivial functions is finite. Okay. okay, so that's what a scattering diagram is. Now, a key point going back to Vince Abbott and Solomon's point of view uh, is that a scattering diagram, what does a scattering diagram do? It's a way of, it's a data structure for recording how you glue a bunch of standard pieces together. Now, the full details of this is, is a somewhat involved story. So let me just try to wave my hands at this a little bit. Um, of course, waving your hands on Zoom is less effective than waving your hands live, but I will just have to do it anyway. Uh, so here I've drawn a picture that's a little bit more interesting. Here's BP. This is a two-dimensional example. So you should picture that there's some sort of singularity in the affine structure in code dimension two, which in this case is just the origin. Uh, and so in this example, we have five cones, which means that the boundary, this will correspond to some picture uh, of um, some surface with a cycle of, with D being a cycle of five E1s. And then uh, we might have a whole bunch of rays of the, uh, walls in the scattering diagram. So these are all cones that, well, in this case, they're one dimensional, two dimensional one, cones that come out of the origin. So maybe it looks like that. So red is equal to walls in the diagram. And blue is uh, P, that's our encoding. Now, what we're going to do is associated to uh, each of these chambers, we're going to associate a ring. Uh, so here for each chamber, associate a ring, or if you want, you can take spectrum, but so you have a scheme, uh, and this will be the um, I'll take K bracket P, this monomial, a monoid ring modulo one of these ideals I, we fixed, many things we have to fix. And um, if this is the cone sigma, I will take uh, the Laurent monomial ring over this, this base ring uh, given by tangent vectors, integral tangent vectors for cone sigma. So inside each sigma, so this is a single uh, cone sigma here. So we have the ring, same ring sigma 
uh, associated with each of these cones, but then you should think of, once you move them to a different chamber, you, you should think of them as now being a bit different. Uh, so then the idea, so over here we have same ring. And the idea is that this wall here, for example, uh, gives us a recipe for gluing the spec of this to the spec of this uh, by determining a ring of, in this case, an automorphism. Uh, and what is this automorphism going to be? Uh, so in this case, uh, let me move this. Sometimes one gets too hung up with the technology here. And so we want to think of this. Yeah. This ring is associated, uh, so this ring is associated with this uh, cell chamber, this ring is associated with this chamber. Now, what we do is we choose a normal vector that will, of course, be in the dual. Uh, to lambda sigma, a primitive normal vector pointing in uh, in this way. And then this allows you to find a ring homorphism which takes z to the m to z to the m times fd, the m evaluated on m. Uh, I have no idea if that's legible. Uh, hopefully that's legible. I can actually make that bigger or not. Uh, so we have this recipe for uh, defining automorphism of this ring, and that's defined using this FD and this completely uh, determined by FD. Okay, so that gives you a way of gluing together all these uh, rings associated with these pieces. And we also have a ring associated with the edge here. And a ring associated with the edge is uh, K bracket P mod I, um, bracket, uh, it's going to be z plus z minus. Uh, so this co-dimensional one wall is um, rho. I take this whole polynomial ring and divide out by the relation z plus z minus uh, is equal to f uh, d, where again, d is, is this function attached to this wall, uh, FD uh, T to the um, class of the one dimensional stratum corresponding to, uh, to row. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, belabor the point here. The, uh, it's not that difficult, but there are ways of associating then to each of these co-dimensional one walls or ring. And then you can start to glue together all these different rings using some obvious, in this case, other obvious identifications of uh, this as the localization of this or glue these together using these, these automorphisms. So if you glue together all these things, what you get is you get some deformation of some, uh, some maybe infinitesimal deformation of some object associated to the original BP. So in this example, remember I had five cones and what this produces is a flat deformation of the union of five A2s, uh, which you can think of as fitting together essentially as this picture. Uh, so we get in this example, a deformation of a union of five affine planes. So this will look something like this. Minus this point. So minus a common point of intersection. So in general, any, um, at least in two dimensions, any old scattering diagram allows me to construct uh, such a flat definition. And uh, because the actual definition is quite complicated, let me just say roughly, 
maybe even more vaguely. Scattering diagram is consistent. If this gluing procedure produces a, um, a flat deformation of the geometric objects, sort of the scheme corresponding to, uh, maybe I should just call it the Stanley Reisner scheme because that's what it is, the Stanley Reisner scheme. associated with BP. So in general, I, I don't want to go through details here, uh, but in general, that's just a union of affine in spaces uh, glued together in the same way that the cones of E are glued together. Okay, uh, so the actual definition of consistency is, is a bit complicated uh, and involves things called broken lines. And to properly talk about this, probably requires a two hour talk. Um, but roughly, consistency what you really want in a scattering diagram is that this will produce such a, a deformation. So, the point is that in general, uh, it's quite hard to just come up with if you have some nasty singularity, even in two dimensions, if you have some nasty singularity at the origin, uh, it's not obvious how to cook up a consistent scattering diagram. And one way of doing it is using uh, the one we do KXD. Now, finally, we come to the canonical scattering diagram. So for an N minus two, okay, so we're going to fix some data. So unfortunately, again, we much time, so it'll be a bit brief. Uh, fix an n minus two dimensional family. The tropical curves on B uh, with one leg. So I'm going to draw some pictures to indicate what I mean. Uh, so let me draw an example where the dimension is three, but since I'm very bad at drawing, uh, three-dimensional pictures, I'm going to draw a slice of that. So this might be kind of a slice of this. You can imagine maybe there's something coming out of the plane of the, the, uh, the paper and uh, something coming out, uh, out of the iPad and into the iPad. Uh, but let's not worry about that. I'll just draw some planar tropical curves. Now, we interpret tropical curves quite loosely in the sense that um, Things like balancing are only hold, um, in general, will only hold uh, when well, you make sense of the balancing condition uh, away from the singularities of the affine structure. So you insist only that dance, balancing holds um, away from co dimension two. So, for example, uh, remembering that I'm in three dimensions, this ray is part of. Um, is part of the uh, uh, the discriminant locus, and hence you have no affine structure along here, and hence uh, you could have tropical curves that just end here. There's no balancing addition, uh, and then they might go out. And then in this case, you have a leg going out to infinity, uh, and this is this is the leg in this case. Now another example uh, is would be something like this. Uh, and this is a leg here. So what I mean by leg is something that either just goes out to infinity or just stops. And you should imagine there's no vertex on this end here. So that's why I draw this open circle. Uh, notice in both cases, these are essentially one dimensional families. Because, uh, this is entirely determined by location of this point. If I move up and down, I always have a vertex here. And similarly, uh, this one is determined entirely by the location 
of this one. So they both give me the one, one parameter of gamma as a tropical occurrence. Uh, and furthermore, I'm going to use the, um, this tangent vector I'm going to call u out. It's the outgoing tangent vector. So u out is uh, an element of, this is sigma, is an element of the tangent space to sigma. And similarly, uh, in this case, u out is the tangent vector. Not necessarily a primitive tangent vector to uh, u out, it depends on the weight of the edge. Okay, so we're going to fix such a, uh, uh, a family of tropical curves. And let's let dt, uh, d tau, I'm going to call this family of curves tau, let d tau be the n minus one dimensional cone. Um, traced out by the leg. So for example, uh, with this tropical curve, uh, this leg traces out this, this whole cone here. And with this tropical curve, the leg traces out this orbit. So that's going to be a wall. We'll assume, we'll throw out, uh, throw this out, ignore tau if um, dimension d tau is less than n minus one, it's not going to play a role, it doesn't produce a wall. And then we get a wall uh, consisting of this co-dimensional one cone d tau. And now the function x of uh, k tau, the function tasher is going to be the following. k tau n tau a t to the a uh, z, ah, sorry, I also, I missed something here. Fix also the curve class a in p. We get a wall, uh, and I'll explain what these terms are here in a second, minus u out. Uh, where so n tau a is a, okay, so this is what's called the puncture ground Witten grant. So this uh, is a notion introduced by Bromwich, Chen, um, myself, and Zebra, paper fun appeared in the archive a few months ago. Uh, so this counts counting curves of genus zero, which tropicalize uh, to uh, curves in the family tau or maybe degenerations of such. So in our setup, there's a way of associating to such a family of tropical curves. There's a way of actually associating a grown wooden class, which uh, the way that we think set things up, the Krabi out condition, combined with this uh, requirement on the dimension of this family tau, guarantees a zero dimensional, so you actually have a, have a number. Uh, so here, of course, A was the curve class, uh, U out, I said, was this outgoing tangent direction, and K tau is a, um, uh, is of some lattice index, so I'll skip the, the details. So can N tau A be equal to zero? Yeah, so I mean, you know, for, in a sense, for, for most choice of tau, for most choice of A, it's going to be zero, in which case you get a trivial wall, you'll just get uh, X of zero, which is one. Um, okay. 
Okay, so uh, I'm out of time. So let me just sort of add a quick word. So proof is, is not so difficult. And the ingredients are Uh, first of all, a puncture curve where a puncture curve, by the way, I, maybe I should say that this kind of tropical curve can be viewed as a tropicalization of what is now a more traditional logarithmic uh, stable map. Uh, and this leg corresponds to having a point with not negative, with ordinary, sort of some specified orders of tangency with the boundary non-negative orders of tangency. These things uh, correspond, this is, is finite edge, corresponds to specifying some negative, or possibly negative orders of tangency of a marked point with the boundary divisors. And making sense of that really requires logarithmic geometry. Uh, so we call such curves uh, that allow these negative contact orders puncture curves. And so puncture curve, uh, broken line correspondence theorem. Broken lines are the things that one really uses to define consistency. And uh, once you get that correspondence theorem, then um, um, ah, what am I trying to prove? I didn't say what I was trying to prove in Russia. Theorem, if D canonical, um, consists of all such walls, then uh, D canonical is consistent. That's what you should view as being the main theorem of this talk. Um, so the key point is that broken lines are purely tropical objects Punctured curves are actual genuine curves that live in the, in the logarithmic uh, world of logarithmic growing rhythm theory. Uh, so you need a, a theorem saying that broken lines correspond to punctured curves, and then you use deformation invariance. So growing with invariance of the kind of invariance we're making use of here. But it's actually, I found it rather surprising how easy the, the proof was after now 20 years of development of, of these ideas. Um, yeah, I should also mention, so uh, Tony and, and, and Sean Keel also in their paper have uh, have some version of this also, uh, again, with the, the x hypotheses. So I better end there because I'm, I'm over time. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Question. Uh, so, yeah, question. oh yeah, I have a question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I, yeah, uh, so, okay, so in this case, okay, so you actually succeeded in building up a sort of like a consistent scattering diagram, like a canonical scattering diagram, right? And uh, mm -hmm. so whenever we, whenever you have a scattering like a canonical like a consistent scattering diagram, you can is go through sort of like a gluing process to build up the mirror construction, right? That's right. So is it, so do you treat it as like a second way of constructing mirror? Yeah, like, so we actually have another theorem. Absolutely, uh, it's somehow, the, the way we would have done this maybe 10 years ago, uh, okay. but another theorem is the resulting mirror uh, agrees with the one we constructed Okay, I see. Directly from, uh, by constructing the coordinate ring directly. I see. That will also be in, in this paper that's coming out, as I say. Yeah, because here you construct really locally glue non archimedean spaces. Yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 and so in a sense, it, it, this point of view, I think, is, is more detailed. It tells you more about what's going on. And in fact, it you know, gives you more possibility for actually calculating. Uh, but it, it, Mark, if you construct a non-Archimedean, not a formal scheme, do you save on, on the uh, point, uh, first point in the proof, this correspondent theorem? 
Uh, do you save? Uh, I mean, just will it become kind of uh, straightforward? I, I don't think it's, um, I mean, maybe Tony can answer that question a bit more than I can, but um, I, I think you know, essentially any ingredient. So in, in Kill You, there is also a, um, there's essentially a, some kind of correspondence there. I'm saying that uh, uh, you can you can count sort of broken lines in a non archimedean way. Um, yeah, you know, whatever you do, you need to prove something like that because you really need to, to understand better. Uh, yeah, rather than trying to understand some some tropical geometry, which turns out to be more complicated, uh, it's easier to just understand that. Uh, in a sense, what you're doing is as you move the puncture, uh, the broken line around, you're really just counting some of your own weight invariants who are moving a point constraint around. And I think that exactly the same ideas in, in QLU. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't, I mean, the, I don't think you save uh, in the sense that um, I think the, the idea of a proof is simply the same. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Mark. And uh, I'm gonna stop recording and we can still continue chatting for the next 20 minutes until. Okay.